provide assistance for the cohesion of the West, getting our normal Democratic allies to talk more effectively together at a different generational level than we do at the leadership level. And we are pursuing that today as a result of that conference last October. Larry Eagleberg, with whom you know, is here to have been with us today. And he is a strictly with Juan Miguel Ocas. And we've all uh, wondered about that and at his age since <laughs> we regret that uh, Larry Eagleberger could not be with us, Mr. President, but he sends his best wishes, and we've asked uh, Secretary Brock, who's been uh, very much involved in these discussions and an architect of many of these ideas, if he would uh, introduce this uh, topic to you uh, at this point in the meeting, Mr. Secretary. Well, uh, we really just began, Mr. President, but the, uh, you know the people here. We've got American business, American labor, American foundations, American government people. We've got uh, individuals from Japan, France, Great Britain, uh, Australia. And it, it, it is a fascinating subject, I think, that we're trying to develop the possibility of putting together in several different countries a foundation that would work to reunify the West to establish those basic values of freedom that unite us. We've been talking about the fact that uh, an awful lot of people in this country don't remember Vietnam, much less Korea and World War II. And they don't know why we put together uh, uh, some of the institutions that we have to, to hold the free world together. And there are, you know, there are members of Congress who are good and well-intentioned and honorable people, but they uh, they may not have a sense of uh, the, the heritage behind uh, uh, behind our, our, our relationship with other countries and the need to, to strengthen uh, that relationship and hold free peoples together in, in a common purpose. We have uh, uh, an awful lot of uh, people in this world who, you know, really don't even want to look outside our own borders. But that's how we got into wars before. And I don't think any of us wants to repeat that. Uh, the, the, the strength of the Western Alliance is, a, is the most important single strength we have in preserving the peace. So what we're talking about is the possibility of, they've already begun to put together uh, a, a foundation in Great Britain, which uh, David Wells and, and others, uh, Peter Pryor, or James Pryor are putting together. We are discussing the possibility of doing it here, perhaps, in, uh, in other countries as well, with a view to seeing if we can't uh, have a permanent, large institution that would have as its central and sole purpose maintaining the cohesion of Western philosophy, Western ideals and values, and Western free nations. And I thought it was a pretty exciting thing. We, uh, we really wanted to just uh, expose you to the idea and, and get your initial reaction. And, you remember uh, one of the great speeches I think I've ever heard was your speech to the British Parliament about uh, four years ago, was it now? June. And you talked in that speech about uh, about maintaining uh, support for democratic institutions around the world. And out of that speech, we formed the National Endowment for Democracy, which is now ongoing. Wayne Kirkman's on the board. John Richardson is the president of it. Uh, but uh, you know, you, you've been such an advocate of, of this sort of thing, and we wanted you to have a sense of, of what we were talking about and where we're going, and, and maybe get some reaction from you if you, uh, if you would share some thoughts with us. But I'd be very pleased to, Bill, as a boardman, and distinguished friends here. I uh, I can't tell you how significant I consider your work to be. When I made that speech at the Parliament, what I had in mind was that the whole world. The free world is beset constantly, with subversion being the principal weapon, with an ideology in the world that is contrary to everything that democracy stands for. And uh, how come we're not just as busy being missionaries on the, for the right side? I'm sure you know it for many years. I've been concerned with the manifold dangers to our precious freedoms. The Atlantic Alliance and the broader community with our friends in the Pacific formed the indispensable 
heart and core of any serious effort to protect her and extend democracy and the free way of life. If our precious community of common values and shared interests erodes and lands the prospect for freedom in a world where we bleak indeed, if our peoples, young and old, do not comprehend well the fundamental importance of our democratic values and institutions and do not strive constantly to preserve and enlarge our freedom from those of like-minded peoples, then our Western community will indeed falter. What you're doing, seeking to project the free Western vision into the 21st century, is an absolutely vital task. Governments have an important role to play in promoting this great vision. As you know, this administration has sought mightily to buttress the forces of democracy around the world and to foster the ties of community among the Western peoples. The greatly expanded inter allied youth exchange programs, a product of close cooperation among governments and with the private sector, constitute an excellent example of what is needed and what can be done. I'll continue to ask our allied partners to join in ever greater governmental efforts of this kind. But I must tell you frankly that at this moment, the continuing capacity of the United States government to play its full role in this constructive work and indeed in every area the management of our relations with other countries is in jeopardy. In its zeal to curb expenditures, our Congress has drastically and mistakenly cut this country's foreign affairs budget. These cuts must be restored and soon, or our world rule could be gravely impaired. And I'm sure that our foreign friends around this table are as concerned as we are with the implications of this crisis. We must realize that these new budgetary constraints could seriously affect our ability to work with governments and peoples to build the strong community of the, of the free, which we also earnestly desire. And my own fellow citizens here, I can only urge that you study and ponder this grave problem and make your views urgently <coughs> At a time when financial constraints are, in any case, great, it becomes all the more necessary, indeed vitally so, that non-governmental forces in our Western world play the fullest possible role they can. Bill, you've emphasized that the foundation you're proposing is a private initiative. Well, this aspect of your work also is of deep personal importance to me. Early in this administration, we took steps to reappraise the role of volunteerism, charity, and private initiative for public purposes throughout the United States. In the field of international affairs, we saw special opportunities for private commitment. Governments and private forces in the countries represented here joined with us, for example, in greatly increasing the exchanges of our youth so that they would understand from personal experience how precious are the ties which bind us together. I've often thought, if all the young people of the world could get to know each other, I don't think anyone would ever be able to produce a war again. So I believe strongly that what you all and the University of South Carolina are sponsoring is not only for a strategic and noble end, but that you've chosen the right means. Your action is in the spirit of a great Western tradition, namely the right and indeed the duty of private citizens to act on their own initiative to serve important purposes of the community. The community you seek to serve comprises nearly one billion free citizens who carry with them the hopes of mankind. Gentlemen, I salute you and I wish you Godspeed in this historic enterprise and assure you of my warm and unstinted support for your efforts. I mentioned in my remarks here our own stepping up of the encouragement of the private initiative in these days, and uh, last year we saw the results of that. The, we set an all-time record for private financial contributions to worthy causes and charities and so forth. It was $79.8 billion, which is more than the national budgets of over two-thirds of the countries of the world. And uh, it just, it's going back to an early pioneer heritage where the people don't wait anymore or don't automatically turn and look for government to do it. They see a problem and they, uh, the next thing you know, a committee has been formed and they go after it. <laughs> so, well, again, as I say, uh, I'm heart and soul interested in this. Stick around for a while. We'd love to have you, and uh, we might even hit you for a contribution. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I've got a whole five minutes. <laughs> I can stay here. Well, maybe maybe we could get one of our friends from uh, England to talk about what they're doing now. Uh, James or Come on, David. David, you better there. Go ahead. <coughs> well, he had his shot. Why don't you give us the yes, perspective? Yes. Well, Mr. President, I listen very carefully to what you have to say, and I agree so much with what you said. And uh, <coughs> I think it is up to the, if you like, the private sector and the private individuals to play that full part. What has happened, I think, in recent years is that the generation of which most of us around this table fall apart have had good connections and have understood uh, the problems. But um, we now talk to ourselves, and I doubt very much whether we actually disseminate what we think down to a lower generation or a, a new generation that is coming up. I was lucky enough, oh, 25, 30 years ago, to, to have a Smith Month foreign leader grant to come to this country. And that made an enormous impression upon me and has enabled me ever since to keep contacts with friends here that otherwise I never would have made. Now, I doubt whether, and that's an example of a, an, an Englishman who uh, would have always had close contacts with American friends, but I doubt whether the same thing is happening now in the way that it should with a new generation of politicians, a new generation of businessmen and, and public leaders throughout the Western world. And again, I think we have now a number of uh, institutions where we talk from country to country. For example, in, uh, Britain had a very good relationship through the Koenigs Winter Conference with Germany. Now, that was instrumental, I think, in helping us to become a member of the European community. But since that time, it's really rather lost some of its impact, and I think uh, that sort of institution needs to be renewed and helped by, uh, by a greater institution and a foundation which could, as it were, draw these things together rather more and disseminate that information to a much la larger and wider uh, group of people than was possible perhaps 20 or 30 years ago. And so I think from um, Great Britain's point of view, uh, we want to play our part. We are already playing our part. I think Sir David came to see me nearly two years ago on this particular subject, and I think that uh, we should certainly wish to support fully what you're doing. We have a slight problem in that our uh, laws regarding the giving of money to charity uh, in order to, and to get tax relief on the gift restrict us to very much to an educational background. We can't do it for, as it were, to be uh, overt political purposes. And so we have to be a little bit careful in the way that we would uh, join in your endeavor here. But I don't think that would be something we can't overcome. But it's something we have to watch the whole time. We get the same restrictions. We have the same restrictions here. Yeah. Some, but 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 isn't fundamentally what we're talking about education. I mean, we're really talking about educating our teachers to teach Western values and Western community. We're, we're talking about educating our politicians to get to know each other and to, and to communicate. Them. As long as we express it in that way, we shall not fall well. <laughs> We've been having some problems education-wise, and some even apropos what Bill said about remembering the war. I was shocked the other day, and some people interested in this, and, and we, we've been moving. It's not just standing and static. In education, we found that some of our college students, when given the names Hitler and Churchill, couldn't identify who they were or uh, what, uh, where they figured in history. And, forgive me some of you here, but they also found that they could not point on a map to England, France, or, or, or Germany. And they couldn't locate them on, on a map. So a little neglect of geography, if not of other things, but we're moving to on that. On the other hand, my encouragement, one of these, a couple of years ago, the economic center was in Germany. And I was taken up to a castle where there was a great youth meeting going on. And there were 10,000 young Germans. And I spoke to them with an interpreter, interpreting everything that I said. 
And when I finished, I couldn't have said another word because suddenly 10,000 young Germans in my language sang our national anthem. Mm. And then there was a delegation of them waiting to talk to me afterward. And what they wanted to know was, why couldn't there be more student exchanges? Why couldn't more of our children go there and their, their young people come here? And so I came home fired up to find out why. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people that believe that the, uh, that the break of Egypt, uh, when they, Sadat got together, if you remember, on the, on the, with the Israelis, that that had its genesis when Sadat came to the United States on an exchange program in the 1950s, and it colored his whole belief about this country from that day forward. He used to talk about that. I'm, I'm, I really do believe it, and I think it works. And one of the principal way. things of this whole project, Mr. President, is the student exchange program and the, the movement of the Soviets do so much better job getting students into the Soviet Union than we do by a hundredfold. We yeah. need to do a much better job of that than we have. And you know, even there, their view that Suzanne Massey, who's in and out of Russia and is connected with the Harvard School of Russian Studies and so forth, was here the other day. And she was telling me about what she has seen in her experiences over there. She speaks fluent Russian and has done a number of books on Russian history and so forth. She said the young people in Russia don't have any place to hang out like our young people do. There are no things of that kind. She found out what their substitute is. It's the bank of the river. She said they gathered out of the thousands and just sit there and watch the bridges <laughs> go up to the, the boat bridges <laughs> over. But she said this last trip she was amazed. They were all wearing blue jeans and tennis shoes on and so forth. And uh, she even saw some of them doing what's called break dancing here. <laughs> they uh, started in New York and all of this. She was amazed at this, but she was more amazed when a whole gang of them started singing in English the song that was the revolutionary song here in this country a few years ago, We Shall Overcome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where they found or learned it. And uh, she said there's something stirring there in those young people that uh, and we could exactly target on them also. Great. Mr. President, we know you have to leave, but if you will recall, because of your interest in the youth exchange, we started the President's International Youth Exchange, which you took up at the Versailles Summit uh, with the other economic summit countries. Uh, we tried out the idea by having each head of state designate some people who came to Paris in May, just before the June summit. It looked like it would work. You took it up at the summit. It did work. We put the thing together. We've had over 15,000 American exchange students participate and thousands of others. We started with seven countries. We're up to 20-some now. We raised over $4 million privately. We had a committee of over 100 large national corporations. It might be that those summit leaders' recognition of the shared values and their relevance to these stirring times are embodied in the same thing we're talking about, and perhaps at your next economic summit, we can pull these things together and have these heads of state endorse the private sector to go forward with these values that are enshrined and why we're all free countries, and in selling this thing, promoting the kinds of funds we need and the type of uh, motivation and commitment from others, I think this thing would really fly very well if you feel that that would be something that you could uh, earnestly advocate. Well, yes I can, and you might all be asked to know I'm in just the next few minutes going to speak to a group that's called the National Fraternal Organization, made up of some 200 various organizations. And it's 100 years old, celebrating its 100th anniversary. And it is dedicated to this whole private thing. And now, for the first time, in Paris, France, shortly, there is going to be an international meeting on the whole subject of privatization. And right. this, this type of thing. November 24th. I know I have to go, but just to tell you, since we <laughs> mentioned we know the philosophy as opposed to what we're talking about here. And he said, well, I suppose it was a politician. She said, that explains it. Science would have tried it on mice first. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I'm sorry that I answered that wrong.
It encompasses the fundamental concept of caring upon which all of our societies are based. Paternalism are supporting of your grassroots private sector initiative. Last year, a six million hours of volunteer service to their community. And you can see why we are justly proud today. situation does remind me of a story. I find that increasingly things remind me of stories. This was one about the fellow that was the only survivor of the gender and he said, oh, that would be fine with me. And he told St. Peter what he'd been doing all these years, speaking about that great, that fellow second from the left in the first row, his name Noah. <laughs> century, the French observer Alexis de Tocqueville wrote these words about volunteer efforts in America to our country. On behalf of a grateful nation, I commend you, and if I may say so, I think you owe yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> well, now, since, as I said a moment ago, you're experts in tourism in their society. As a result, an international conference on private sector initiatives will be taking place in Paris, France this month. This autumn, the In fact, I don't, and I don't think you intend to rest until Nicaragua at last experiences true freedom and democracy. Here at home, a profound change is to success in foreign policy, a newly patriotic and self-confident nation. Why should this be? Well, the quote be necessary. In order to defend our republic and demonstrate to friends and adversaries alike the seriousness of our arms. Yet beyond all the programs, there's something more base and robbed by junkies. They're the people who pay higher insurance rates because of such robberies. And they're the people who pay higher prices for goods of all kinds because drugs in the workplace have illegal drug use. As I've said before, no drug network will remain alive. But the point I want to stress before you today is that while government can accomplish certain things you've been doing since 1971, I know that the organizations represented here, as I say, are already commend you for that, and I'm grateful to know that we can continue to count on your support in the months to come. So please, continue helping all Americans say no to drugs. Mr. President, uh, we have a plaque for you here, and I'd like to read it uh, before presenting it to you. The National Fraternal... This is Corporal David Nias. Yes, yes, yeah, moving on. Yes, sir. Where are you, where are you going? Are we going back to the Greenberg State tonight? Well, thank you for everything here. Good luck to you. Shall we? Thank you. All right. Yeah. And sometimes you may put on civilian clothes and put a necktie or something. So here's a tie bar as a souvenir. Yes, sir. Why not, sir? Thank you, Mr. President. Well, good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, Dottie. Mr. President, sir, your good friends, Lynn and John Summers. Nice to see you. Why don't we turn around here and get a picture? Why don't you get one there? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. She told you how we abuse her. 
Oh, uh, she's told us what a wonderful time she's had. <laughs> <laughs> how great, how great it and is. And how wonderful you've been to her. This is a belated goodbye because I know you're all already in place at the I'm at work. The other end. <laughs> well, there's on. a little charm. Oh, what do you say, girl? Thank you. Thank you, you so much. And a tie bar for you. Oh. Oh. How about that? And a bookmark. Well, thank you very much. This is just a little souvenir of the Oval Office. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Pleasure. I feel guilty taking your valuable time, but it gives me an opportunity to say thank you for the opportunities and the experience that I've had, but more importantly, I'm doing it because these people have made sacrifices, the missed dinners and the weekends and the late hours, and I wanted to let them have a chance to say hello and tell you what, uh, what a uh, fantastic opportunity it's been and how proud we are to be able to help you do what you do. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for all that you've done and what you're continuing to do over now and just another building. <laughs> <laughs> all right, sir. But, all right, and he has. He's worked very hard, and that's for our country, for you all to grow up in. What were you going to say to him? Um, Mrs. Reagan, what? Um, tell her that we all don't take drugs. So we say no, right? We say no. You say no, just say no. <laughs> all right, I think that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, just say no back. <laughs> <laughs> she'll, be, she'll be very happy to hear that, maybe. Okay. Thank you for your time. What happened to the hand? A window fell on it. Yesterday. Yeah, I was opening up the window and I didn't know if I broke my, my mom he didn't tell me and they went smash. Hmm. Well. Fortunately, she's left-handed, so she can still do her homework. <laughs> <laughs> With Steve and Steve Jr. Jackson. How are you, Mr. President? Good to see you. Good to see you. My family. This is my Hi. son, Stephen, and my husband, Steve. Good to see you. Look at the camera, Stephen. When are you you're supposed to smile? Yeah, it's great to meet you, the President. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there you go. Say, so what's going on here? I appreciate all that you've been doing. And <laughs> what do you think, Tad? He can probably mm -hmm. figure out what these are already. <laughs> this is a little souvenir for you. Oh, so thank you, you very much. Office. No, thank you very and, much. Uh, this it's really too early for him, <laughs> but it's for him. But it's a jar with a seal on it, and inside the jar are jelly beans. Oh, sorry, Steve. Oh, so what? When he oh. gets to the coming bean stage. <laughs> <laughs> what does it, will your dentist think of that, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate oh, so much. Sure we do. Enjoy yeah. working well, for well, you, and well, we appreciate you doing this, too. As you know, the family is the one that doesn't get to do the fun things or, <laughs> or anything, so we appreciate you yes, we do. having well, us in today. Yes, we do. I play now and then and make some sports celebrities. <laughs> 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 There. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. With Daddy Good. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yes, I appreciate sir. Thank you very much. Good. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Can you say bye bye to the president? Can, can you say bye bye? You can only be still. You can only see his camera. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.